Well, as I've already mentioned this evening, we're going to be looking at a portion of Romans chapter 6. As I mentioned in my prayer, Romans is not the easiest book to understand. And uh, hopefully, uh, we'll at least get the gist of what Paul is saying in Romans chapter 6. I'd like to begin by, just simply by reading the chapter. And I think as I do, you'll get a better picture of what we're going to be looking at in the first seven verses of Romans chapter 6. But again, the idea is, or the theme is, that if you've trusted in Jesus Christ, if you're in union with Jesus Christ, that when he died on the cross, you died with him. And when he was raised again to life, you were raised with him. And that means that you are dead to sin, and you are now alive to God, which means now you are to uh, use your bodies, use your gifts, use your talents, everything you have as instruments of righteousness to do what is right and good. To do what is pleasing to the Lord, as we saw this morning, put on the Lord Jesus Christ, make no provision for the flesh. This gives us, again, more reasons to do that. But let's begin by reading Romans chapter 6. Paul writes, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died is freed from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law but under grace." What then, shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? May it never be. Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Therefore, what benefit were you then deriving from the things of which you were now ashamed? For the outcome of those things is death. But now having been freed from sin and enslaved to God, you derive your benefit, resulting in sanctification and the outcome, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I do want you to uh, notice that last part there. The wages of sin is death, that's something we've looked at a little bit earlier, but note that eternal life is a free gift from God. It's not something that we earn. Paul here is talking about the results of, of our salvation, the results of having trusted in Jesus when he talks about yielding to God. He's not saying that this is how we work our way to heaven. It certainly uh, is not. Well, let's, um, let's take a look at what it is we have been looking at. Um, and what we've been looking at is reasons why even one sin 
is too much sin, too much to allow, one too many in, in our lives. Why you should not allow or make room for even one. Now, so far we, we've seen that you shouldn't because even one sin deserves eternal damnation. As we just saw in Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death. And I would remind you it only took one sin to plunge the whole human race into the misery that we're in right now with all the war and famine, death, destruction, and so forth when Adam ate of that tree as our representative. So unless you think one sin is insignificant, it's not really so insignificant, is it? It destroyed the whole human race. So the wages of sin is death. Don't even allow one. And even though Jesus died for your sins, and even though not one of your sins will ever condemn you because you've trusted in Jesus Christ, you should never begin to think that it doesn't matter now how you live. Every sin still deserves eternal death. And for that reason alone, you should stay as far, as far away as possible as you can from it. Now, one thing that I didn't think about until um, as I was preparing the sermon, because there's a lot of things we could really add to this series as to why we shouldn't allow any sin in our lives. But do you realize that there were many sins? And really, not that it's not the case anymore, but there were many sins in the Old Testament that God actually required the death penalty for. And many of them were sins, well, many of them by God's grace, thankfully, we've never committed and hopefully by His grace we never will. And very few of these are actually still punished by death today. Murder, sometimes. Uh, rape was certainly uh, punishable by death. Adultery, kidnapping, homosexuality, punishable by death. Even though, oddly enough, I, I don't know if you've, if you've uh, seen, I mean, some of the things that sometimes pop up on the screen, but there are actually Christian, what so-called Christian websites devoted to homosexual dating for Christians. I mean, that's, that's how far wrong uh, people can be regarding what the Bible actually says. Now, again, perhaps we haven't committed those particular sins, but there are other sins that maybe some of us, maybe most of us, if not all of us, actually have that in the Old Testament um, were worthy of death. I mean, all of us at one time or another before we came to Christ were actually idolaters. We worship something other than the true God, and that was a sin that was worthy of death. Perhaps before we came to Christ, we blasphemed God. Maybe we cursed Him. Maybe we broke the Sabbath. You know, in the Old Testament, there was a man who was found picking up sticks on the Sabbath because he was going to kindle a fire. And when, when they took him into custody and asked the Lord what to do with him, the Lord said, put him to death. He's broken the Sabbath. That's what that sin deserves. Or maybe we cursed our parents. Do you realize that that was a capital crime as well in the Old Testament? Well, if you've ever committed any of these sins, you can be thankful that in the Lord Jesus Christ, those are forgiven as well. God has had mercy on us through Jesus Christ. You realize, of course, from what I've already said, every single sin deserves far worse than capital punishment. It deserves everlasting damnation. And again, reasons why we should stay as far away from sin as we possibly can. Now, by the way, the, the, the fact that we have committed sins maybe like these and the Lord has shown us mercy, that's also a very good reason why you and I should not be so quick to condemn others for the sins that they have committed. Have you heard the expression, but by God's grace, you know, but for God's grace, there go I? I mean, the only thing that makes us to differ from anyone else is the grace that God has shown us. And that's why you should deal gently with those that you find who are in sin, whether they be outside the household of God or within. Now, sometimes, and especially when we get an elevated view of what God really desires of us and we begin to think that we've achieved some of this and, and we're sort of arrived as it were, we can adopt a pharisaical spirit and begin to look down on others and, and condemn them for the, even the small things we see in them. We have to be careful that we don't do that because it's only God's grace that makes any of us to differ and we also know we have done things that deserve damnation. That's why Paul writes in Galatians 6 verses 1 through 2, brethren, 
Even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. You know, as I thought about that particular passage, I wonder if Paul isn't actually saying here that if we are harsh with other people, we may find ourselves in the same situation, being tempted by something where we're going to have to have somebody come and, and deal with us. The Lord wants us to be gentle. He wants us to love, not condemn, and try to bring them back, try to restore them, try to bring them to Christ that they might be reconciled and not, as it were, pull in our skirts and cry out unclean and pass by on the other side, as it were. We saw that you shouldn't allow even one sin in your life because if you do, remember, if you, even pr if you practice even one sin, and by that I mean, again, you embrace it, you don't fight against it, you don't try to put it off, that one sin can destroy you. I mean, listen again to what John writes in 1 John 3, 9. No one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him and he cannot sin or he cannot practice sin because he is born of God. We know we can all sin. We can do that well enough. But we can't practice sin. And the reason we can't is because God has given us his Holy Spirit if we've trusted Jesus. And his Spirit gives us a love for everything that is good, everything that is right, and that love makes you hate everything that isn't good and everything that isn't right, everything that is sinful, and not just for some sinful things, but for every sinful thing. Now, if you embrace any sin, if you don't hate every sin, but you embrace one, even just one, and you practice that, it really means that you don't hate sin. Because if you did, you'd hate that sin as well as all the other sins. And if you don't hate that sin, that means you don't love righteousness. Because if you did love righteousness, you'd hate every sin. And if you don't love righteousness, it means that you don't have the Spirit of God. And if you don't have the Spirit, you're not saved. And if you're not saved, then even that one sin can destroy you, you see. In Christ, no sin can destroy you. But outside of Christ, any sin and every sin will destroy you. So that's a good reason to stay away from every sin and not allow yourself to practice any or, or even to give in to any at, at, at any point. And we saw last week that you shouldn't allow even one sin because every sin is contrary to love for Jesus Christ. Remember what Jesus says in John 14, verses 23 through 24. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my Father will love him. And we will come to him and make our abode with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. You see, your obedience is really a measuring stick by which you can measure your love for Jesus. To the degree that you love him, to that degree you're going to obey him. To the degree that you don't love Jesus, to that degree you won't. And this should give us reason to pause before we decide to do anything that is either against his will or we suspect may be against his will because it may be doing injury to the one whom we love. If we love Jesus, we won't want to allow even one thing in our lives that is offensive to him. Now this evening, let's consider one more reason why you should never allow even one sin in your life, and that is because in Christ you are dead to sin. You've died. You're no longer alive, at least in that regard. Now Paul began chapter 6 by arguing that you should never break God's law so that his grace can increase. Remember, we looked at that at least at some point in the near past. Some people were using God's grace and the fact that God can glorify his grace, his mercy, in his forgiveness. They used that as an excuse as to why they should sin more. I'll just give God another reason to glorify his grace so you realize we all give him enough of those reasons already when we try to obey him. You know, we don't need to sin so that God will have more opportunities. There's, there's plenty already. But Paul gives us an even more obvious reason why you must never allow any sin in your life. Why, as we saw this morning, you were to uh, put on Jesus Christ and make no provision for 
for your flesh with regard to its lusts. And that's because you died with Christ to sin when you were baptized into him and you have been raised again with him to a new kind of life. Now, really, I don't know what else there is to say than what we've already read in this text, but hopefully some of these things will make sense. Now, what I'd like to do is look at two things this evening. First of all, what it means that you have been baptized into Christ, because that's very key to Paul's argument. Is he talking about water baptism here? What exactly is he talking about? And secondly, how this baptism into Jesus Christ will, I should say, should affect your life, but how it will affect your life, it uh, should make a radical difference in the way that you live. So first of all, what does it mean that you have been baptized into Christ? I think the first and most obvious question here is, Paul, is, is Paul speaking about water baptism? Now, you know, there's, there's a, a lot of believers who believe that that's exactly what he's talking about here and even go further to say that what Paul is teaching is that water baptism actually saves you, that God works through it. The, actually, the baptism itself washes away your sin or somehow God works through it to apply Jesus Christ to you. He uses it as a means to connect you to Jesus Christ, water baptism, because of this passage and because of others like it. Let's look at a couple of them. Peter, in 1 Peter 3.21, writes this. Corresponding to that, that is, God's salvation of Noah's household through the flood in the ark and so forth, uh, corresponding to that, baptism, ba excuse me, baptism now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's a denomination that actually teaches baptismal regeneration on the basis of this passage. That the way that we exercise faith is by being baptized. Okay, well, we want to see whether or not that's actually true. Now, Peter also says to the Jews on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2.38, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now the question we need to ask here, and by the way, we should uh, maybe add one more, but it's not, it's not in our list, won't be on the thing behind us, but remember in Mark chapter 16, uh, Jesus told his disciples, go into all the earth and preach the gospel to every living creature. Everyone who believes and is baptized will be saved. Everyone who doesn't believe will be condemned. Now the question is, is Jesus, Peter, Paul, are they teaching baptismal regeneration? Are they teaching you have to be baptized in order to be saved? Now, let, let's begin by first of all reviewing how it is we are saved, and then we'll see that this cannot be the case. If that is what they actually meant by what they're saying, then they would be contradicting other clear truths in Scripture. For instance, if baptism, if, if water baptism washes away your sins. And if this is the means that God actually uses to apply Jesus' work to your life, again, as, as many people believe, then the thief on the cross quite obviously could not have been saved. And why is that? Well, because he wasn't baptized. And yet, our Lord said to him in Luke 23, 43, truly I say to you, Today, you shall be with me in paradise. Now, paradise, as we know, is heaven. And you can only get to heaven if you're saved. So, Jesus was telling the thief, you're saved. If water baptism is what saves you, then, then Paul could not have said what he says in 1 Corinthians 1, 14 through 15. I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one would say you were baptized in my name. Now, wouldn't you think that if water baptism or salvation by water baptism were true, wouldn't you expect Paul to say something more along the lines of, I thank God that I baptized as many of you as possible. Well, that's not what he says. I thank God that I baptized none of you 
except Crispus and Gaius. Is that consistent with salvation by baptism? Baptism with water can't save you. Now, if it's not water baptism that saves you, what is it that saves you? Well, the only thing that can save you is the cross of Christ, his death on the cross, his obedience as well. But the Bible centers in on his death to summarize everything that Jesus did. Every week when we have the Lord's Supper, we read this passage where Jesus takes a cup at the Last Supper, gives thanks, and then he says to his disciples in Matthew 26, 27, and 28, drink from it, all of you. For this is, the, is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. Paul gives us the essence of the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 where he says, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. It is the death of Christ that saves you, again, as well as his obedience. But how is that sacrifice actually applied to you? Is it applied through water baptism? No but by grace alone through faith alone. That is what the Bible teaches. Consider what Peter said to Cornelius in Acts 10, verses 42 through 43. And he, that is Jesus, ordered us to preach to the people and solemnly to testify that this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. Of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. It's no wonder then that Paul writes in Romans 1.16, that very famous and familiar passage, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first, and also to the Greek, notice the common theme, the gospel. Notice the idea of everyone who believes is the one who receives forgiveness of sins, not everyone who is baptized. Now again, the thief on the cross wasn't baptized, but he did believe, didn't he? Before he died, he looked to the Lord and said in Luke 23, 42, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And that's when Jesus said, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Uh, Paul wasn't sent to baptize in water, but he was sent to proclaim the gospel. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1, verses 17 and 18. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech, so that the cross of Christ would not be made void. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Not water baptism, but the gospel. The gospel is the power of God. It's by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, believing on him, turning from your sins, that you receive forgiveness of sins. Now it is true that Jesus commands you to be baptized if you believe, but baptism is not what saves you. Faith in Christ saves you. Baptism is simply... Well, we're going to see in a moment what, what baptism actually is and why it is that Peter and Paul sometimes seem to be teaching salvation by baptism. It, it really has to do with a principle of a symbol and what that symbol is actually pointing to and how sometimes in the Bible the symbol is actually referred to as the reality or what it's pointing to rather than the symbol that it is, and I'll, I'll give you a, a few examples, but I do want you to see that water baptism is sometimes referred to in this way because it is a symbol of the baptism that actually does save you and what it is that Paul's really referring to in Romans chapter six, he's not referring to water baptism. He's referring to another baptism that water baptism is actually a picture of or a symbol of, and that is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, what am I saying? That, that Paul is teaching sort of a second blessing theology here that, um, that you know, as, as many churches believe, the baptism in the Holy Spirit sort of follows with this speaking in tongues and things like that. Well, actually, that's not what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is. And that's not really what the Bible teaches. The baptism that Paul is talking about here, the Spirit, is, according to Scripture, the one that actually puts you in Jesus Christ, that unites you 
to Jesus Christ that immerses you, as it were, in Jesus Christ and brings about the new birth. Another uh, term in Scripture that's used for it is being born again. This is what Jesus was telling Nicodemus when he said to him in John 3, verses 5 and 6, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Now, I realize we might be tempted to think that what Jesus is telling Nicodemus here is that you have to be baptized in water and baptized by the Spirit to enter into the kingdom, but he's not saying that. You'll notice in that second verse, he says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Natural birth, that which is born of the flesh, is birth by water. I think what Jesus is telling Nicodemus here is being born into the family of Abraham isn't enough. Being a child of Abraham according to the flesh is not enough. You have to be a child of Abraham according to the Spirit, according to faith, and that only happens through the new birth. That which is born of the flesh is only flesh, and flesh cannot save you. You have to be born again. You have to be born again by the Spirit, because that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. The Bible says that every believer is baptized by the Spirit into Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one Spirit. Notice this isn't a second blessing meant just for a few. This isn't something that, well, you know, that um, uh, confers upon you some uh, additional blessing beyond salvation. This is salvation. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body. This is how one is born again. This is how one is able to enter into the kingdom of God, as Jesus told Nicodemus. The Spirit baptizes you into Christ. He normally does it under the preaching of the gospel. What he does, again, is he connects you with Jesus Christ. He unites you to Jesus Christ so that the life of Christ flows through you. As long as you're separate from Jesus Christ, you're dead in your trespasses and sins. You have no life in you. But when the Spirit of God connects you to Jesus and unites you to Jesus Christ, well, then you become alive. You experience a spiritual resurrection. Even, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sin, God in His mercy made us alive together with Jesus Christ and He does it through this new birth. And now that you're alive, you're able then to do things that only a spiritually alive person can do, which is to turn from your sins and to trust Jesus. And when you do, He justifies you. This baptism of the Spirit basically turns on the lights. It, it gives you a life. It raises you from the dead so that you do what one who is spiritually alive will do. And that is look to Jesus only for your salvation and turn from everything that is contrary to Him. And of course, once you've trusted in Jesus, His righteousness becomes yours and all your sins are taken away. And you are just in the sight of God, that is when you are saved. Paul tells us really about this in Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 30. If we had time to look at all the different nuts and bolts of this, uh, it would become perhaps a little bit clearer. But this being born again, this baptism of the Holy Spirit is the same thing that is being referred to here as calling, being called. That call is what makes the gospel effective and what gives us life and allows us to trust in Jesus Christ so that we might be justified, he says this, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called, he called. Now we call through the, through the gospel, but there's also a call that comes from God. And this is the one that he issues. He also called, and these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. 
Now, as I've said, water baptism is a symbol of this baptism, of this spirit baptism, the, the baptism that actually does you know, give you life and enables you to trust in Jesus so that you can be saved. Because it's this baptism that actually applies Jesus Christ to you so that your sins are washed away. It's not water baptism, but it's spirit baptism. And that's what Paul writes to Titus in Titus 3, verses 3 through 7. For we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy, hating or hateful, hating one another. But when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy by the washing of regeneration, and renewing by the Holy Spirit whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. That washing, regeneration, and renewing by the Holy Spirit, that is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That is the new birth. That is what Paul is referring to when he says we were baptized into Christ, that we died with him, and we rose again with him to life. This is what connects us to Christ so that whatever Christ went through, whether it, it's in his obedience or in his death on the cross, in his being buried in the tomb, his being raised again to life, his ascending into heaven, his being seated in heaven, and the fact that, um, that we're ruling and reigning with him, all of that is true because we are united with Jesus Christ. Whatever he went through, he went through for us, he went through for you if you are trusting Him. So you died with Him and you were raised again with Him to life when you were baptized into Him by the Spirit of God. Now, as I mentioned before, sometimes that symbol and the reality are, are so closely related in Scripture that one is sometimes referred to as the other. This is something that Martin Luther didn't seem to understand and why Luther had such a hard time with Zwingli at the Marburg Colloquy. Luther couldn't even believe that Zwingli was a Christian because he did not believe that the real flesh and blood of Jesus Christ was in the communion. He said, Jesus says, this is my body, this is my blood. How could he be any clearer than that? Well, we have to ask the question. When Jesus says at the Lord's table that the bread is his body and the wine is his blood, does he mean literally? Jesus' body was intact at that time, wasn't it? Did, did when he told the disciples, you have to eat his flesh and drink his blood, did they grab onto Jesus and begin pulling pieces off of him so that they could live? No, they didn't because they didn't understand quite what he meant at that, at that moment and a number of them didn't follow him anymore because of that. But the 12, or at least 11 of the 12, <laughs> knew that there was no place else to go. They had to you know, find out eventually what Jesus meant by that. But they knew he was the only one who had life, but they knew it wasn't by eating and drinking. And when Jesus said he was the bread of, of heaven, as it were, the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world, did he mean that literally? And again, another example, the tree of life in the garden. Did that tree of life have the ability to confer life, to give life? If they had eaten of that fruit, could they have lived forever? Did the fruit have the ability to give them that life, or was it a symbol of the life that God would have given to them if they had passed the test which they failed and so weren't able to come to the tree. Now, they, they failed, they weren't able to participate in that tree, so now the Lord brings the tree to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to go through Him to get to the tree, but the tree you see doesn't give you life, it's Jesus who gives you life. You don't have to literally eat his flesh. You don't have to literally drink his blood. You don't eat Jesus' bread from heaven, literally. But you do it by faith. It's symbolic. It's meant to get you to look to the reality. The reality is Jesus. You need to receive him. You need to trust him as your means of life, as spiritual food. And the same thing with regard to the water in baptism. You don't look to that water to save you. But you look beyond the water to the washing and regeneration by the Holy Spirit, which actually does save you. So what does Paul mean by this baptism? He's talking about the baptism of the Spirit of God, which actually does this work, unites you to Christ, not water baptism. 
Now, to get to the second question, how will this baptism affect your life? Does it make no difference at all? That's what a, a large amount or a large number of evangelicals believe. The college I went to believes that. Thankfully, the Lord showed me that that wasn't true. But they believe it makes no difference. There'll be no change in your life. As a matter of fact, you can even get worse and still go to heaven. Well, that's not what the Bible says. That's not what Paul tells us here. He says that this baptism will have a profound impact on your life. Now, perhaps not at first. When you first become a Christian, it may start out very subtly, but it's certainly something that grows over the course of your life because its whole purpose is to make you like Jesus Christ. When you were baptized by the Spirit into Christ, the old you died. You died with Him. And a new you was born. Paul writes in Romans 6, verses 6 through 7, our old self was crucified with Him in order that the body, our body of sin, might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is freed from sin. That's certainly true, isn't it? When you die, you, you can't sin anymore. It gives you absolute freedom. Well, it's not quite so absolute now, but it will be one day. But one thing is we have to realize is this, that the person that you were before you came to Christ is no longer alive. He or she, depending on the, on the case, is now dead. You died with Christ when he died on the cross. You died to sin. And that means you were no longer the slaves of sin as you once were when you came into the world. And at the same time, he says, you were also raised up with him as a new creature. In Christ, you know how Christ, uh, well, Paul says in, in Colossians chapter 1 that in Christ all things are made new. That there's a new creation, a new heavens and a new earth. Christ has really, through his work, made all things new. And when you trust in Jesus Christ, you become a part of that new creation. You become a new creature. That's why Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. And if you are a new creature, if you're a new creation, you are going to live differently than you lived before. As we saw this morning, you will be holy and you will have an increasing holiness in your life. You'll have the desire to be holy, to put off the old man and to put on the new. Paul writes in verse 4 of Romans 6, Therefore we have been buried with him through baptism into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Now, you may look like the same person that you were before you came to Christ. You may feel like the same person that you were, but you are not the same person. You are in Christ. His Spirit is in you. You have a new heart, a new disposition towards what God wants you to do so that you no longer have to obey sin. Jonathan Edwards put it very succinctly when he says, the only thing God has to do to make you a new creature is give you a love for what is right. That changes everything. Because now that you want to do what's right, you're going to fight against everything that is wrong. That is the only difference between a believer and an unbeliever, between a person who's saved and a person who isn't saved. The person who is saved loves what is good because the Spirit of God is in him. That new disposition has made you a new creature. It changes the whole direction of your life and it sets you free from sin. Now, does that mean you're no longer going to struggle with sin? Does that mean it's going to be a piece of cake from here on out? Well, obviously not. We wish that were the case, but we know it isn't the case. The struggle is still going to be there and the reason it is is because there's still some sin that is in your heart. As a matter of fact, the struggle begins once the Lord gives you that grace. Galatians 5.17. Paul writes, For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, 
so that you may not do the things that you please. And uh, Paul does not mean here absolutely, but it means you can't live exactly as you would like to live. We would like to be perfect. We want to be perfect. We're striving after perfection, but we can't be perfect because of the struggle that is going on inside of us. By the way, this is another one of the reasons why we don't believe that perfection is possible in this life, but it's reserved for the life to come. That's Wesleyan perfectionism or second blessing theology. It's another form of the second blessing of the Holy Spirit. He believed if you received that second blessing, you would be perfect and sinless in this life. I say, you know, Wesley, I wish that were true. Every true believer wishes that were true, but we recognize it isn't true because we still have sin, we still have the struggle we go through on a daily basis, what Paul is talking about here, the struggle between choosing what is right and choosing what is wrong. Now, we're not perfect, but it does mean that we are free from sin. You don't have to obey sin. You have a choice. You didn't have a choice before, but now you do have a choice you're not perfect, you can't do anything perfectly because of that corruption that's still in you that's going to intrude in everything you do, but you can resist sin. And you can obey God from the heart, even if it isn't perfect, it's still obedience. And that's what Paul's referring to here, not perfection, but we can obey God. We have a choice because He has given us His Spirit, because He has made us new creatures. And so applying this in closing to our subject, even one sin is one sin too many because, as Paul said, if you submit to sin, you become a slave to sin. It becomes your master. Whatever you submit to becomes your master. You can't submit to sin. Sin cannot be master over you. You've died to sin. Your master is Christ. You need to obey Him. You need to submit to Him. You need to do what he calls you to do. You died when you trusted Jesus Christ. You died with him on the cross. You can choose what's right because you now want what is right. And that, as we saw this morning, and as we see this evening, that is what God wants you to do. Exercise the choice that you have in the working out of your sanctification. Choose what the Lord calls you to choose. From the standpoint of our duty, we don't have a choice. From the standpoint of reality, we do, but the Lord tells us, choose what is right. Do not choose sin. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no room, make, take no foresight, make no provision in your life for the flesh with regard to its lusts. You can do that. Because the Spirit of God is in you. Christ has set you free. Now let me just say, finally, to those of you who haven't trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, you can't do this. You can't do what's right because you don't have this desire to do what is right. And again, I've just clarified that by saying you can do outwardly what's right. You can do what God commands you to do outwardly. Uh, you can go through the motions but you cannot do it inwardly. You cannot do it from the heart. You cannot do it because you love God. You can't do it because you want to give glory to God because you need the Spirit of God to do that. If you have not trusted Jesus, as Paul has already said here this evening, you are a slave to sin. And if your condition isn't changed, God is going to bring you into judgment for this. Remember, the wages of sin is death. That applies to everyone outside of Jesus Christ. If you would be free, you need to trust Jesus. He's the only one who can break your chains. You need to come to him. You need to ask him to free you and then see if the Lord will not do what he has promised that he would do in his word to all who will come to him in faith. If that's your situation this evening, Trust in the Lord and let him free you from those chains. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's, um, let's ask the Lord to apply what we've heard this evening uh, to help us to do what the Lord would have us to do.